Welcome to Quick Start Episode 6, the first one without a clever cold open, because I couldn't, for the life of me, figure out a concise way to show off the weirdness of these machines. Because in some ways, they're the most interesting PCs in the series to date, but the thing they do doesn't look too impressive unless you know what's going on. Now, if you're new to this series, here's the premise. Circa 2007, a lot of computers, especially low-end ones, started to take a really long time to boot. Partly, this was because hard drives were slow and SSDs weren't common yet, partly because Windows got a lot bigger when Vista came out. PC builders mostly just ignored the problem, let computers be slow and awful for a few years, but some tried to solve it. They couldn't make Windows faster though, and they wouldn't sell you better hardware for the same price, so the most common fix was to ship a second operating system, usually Linux-based, that was much smaller and could thus boot much faster. It turns out there were a ton of these machines, and I've covered enough of them that summarizing it all is getting unwieldy, but here's the cliff notes. The Sony VAIO booted in four minutes, but its Linux-based DVD player took only 30 seconds. Unfortunately, it was just a DVD player. Asus ExpressGate was a Linux distro built into millions of motherboards and laptops that offered a web browser and very little else. Dell shipped two copies of Windows on the same machine, for some reason. Samsung and Phoenix delivered a laptop that dual-booted Windows and Linux simultaneously through a bizarre memory trick, and Toshiba shipped a laptop that could double as a TiVo. The trickery that we've seen in this series has ranged from fairly tame, a little more than ordinary dual-booting solutions, to wild abuses of PC hardware that have never been seen before or since. But in this episode, we'll be seeing a series of machines from Dell whose ambition actually exceeded what the PC platform was capable of. We'll begin with the Latitude Z600, which is in itself a pretty strange machine. This almost rated its own video because uh, it actually has one completely unique feature and two other features that were unique for over a decade. Uh, but I just decided to make it part of this, so let's take a look at this thing. The Z600 came out in 2010, and it was supposed to be the beginning of a new product line, uh, the Dell Latitude Z series. The overarching Latitude family covers most of Dell's business laptops already, uh, excluding the super high performance precision models, and it already had low end and very high end offerings, but the Z series was supposed to be a new super high end offering targeted specifically at executives. In other words, jewelry computers. Several other manufacturers were making these around the same time. Uh, in fact, CNET called them CEO laptops and said they seem most likely to be used as high-end showpieces by those who don't mind paying premium prices for essentially the same components as lower cost laptops. And sure enough, this thing is pretty heavily focused on aesthetics without much in the hardware department. The CPU is a Core 2 Duo U9400 running at 1.4 gigahertz. I didn't even know they made Core 2s that slow. It also shipped with two gigs of soldered on non-upgradable RAM, which was not really defensible in this era. So Dell definitely put most of their effort into the machine's looks, and it shows. Uh, for one thing, it's uh, pretty dang thin. I mean, <laughs> there were thinner machines to be sure. The MacBook Air had been on the market for years at this point, but the Z600 still evokes a sort of, wow, that's slick response when you see it. It's got a appealing shape given the tastes of the era, and it's finished in this uh, dark cherry color that also has a kind of mild uh, pearlescent sheen. It really is very striking at first glance. Unfortunately, though, I feel like the designers lost the thread pretty quick. The first problem, of course, is the awful soft touch rubber. I mean, it wasn't rotting back when it was new, and it actually still isn't now, but it was still a cheap way to make something feel expensive, and it's very prone to ugly scrapes and scratches. So these probably didn't hold up for very long after you got them out of the box, and by 2010, I wonder if people weren't already starting to figure this out. The next problem, however, is the shoulder pads. I don't know what they were thinking here, but these big chrome braces on the back, they just look hideously out of place. They should have had a matte or a brushed finish, if you ask me, but mostly I'm just not sure why they're here. I'm not sure what they do. And finally, there's the battery. Yeah, oof. The bevel here, I think, doesn't do a very good job of offsetting the pack from the rest of the machine. And the way it juts out from the back as a continuation of the screen's uh, protrusion between the shoulder pads gives the whole thing sort of the affect of a, a Tetris block. Uh, basically, the, the front of the machine looks good, but then it has a bunch of junk in the trunk that sort of ruins the lines, at least if you ask me. 
Now, oddly, uh, the I.O. port situation isn't as impractical as you might expect. Dell really could have flubbed this, but they actually did all right. There's no room for an HDMI, but there is a full-size display port. Uh, there's also full-size RJ45 Ethernet, and we've got two USB ports here, one of which is eSATA, and a headphone jack. That's all pretty respectable, as thin machines go. It's unfortunate that the USB ports aren't 3.0, but that wasn't really in vogue yet. And then there's the power jack. Uh, this easily could have been some tiny, easily breakable, easily losable custom supply, but instead it takes a standard Dell barrel jack. So you can get a replacement power supply for this thing, even for this highly exotic model, for 30 bucks. Commendable. Let's go ahead and open the screen. Now, personally, I think the inside look is also a little underwhelming. That might just be me, though. Uh, I don't love the brushed aluminum trim ring, for instance. I think it kind of looks like an inverted titanium power book. I never thought the two-tone look really worked well there, and I don't really think it works well here either. Also, while the outline of the chassis is the size of a 17-inch notebook, the actual screen is only 16 inches, which is really not the perfect size. They should only make machines bigger or smaller than this. However, it's only that size because it has an inch wide bezel all around the screen. Now, I'm far from the no bezels, bezels are evil kind of guy, but this was kind of absurd even for the era. There is a purpose to it though, and we'll be coming back to it. First, let's fire the machine up. Okay, I've gotten a, a few different boot times when testing this thing. Uh, previously, I got like 50 to 55 seconds, but I think that was about 35. I'm not sure what to do with that. And I was about to say this wasn't even a fair test because we just booted Windows Vista, but this machine actually shipped with Windows 7. I'm not entirely sure why I have Vista on here. I have no notes on the subject. Uh, the earliest reviews of the system say the review samples came with Vista Ultimate installed, but they also said the production models would probably ship with 7, and sure enough, this has a Windows 7 COA on the bottom, so I don't know what this is doing on here. I must have had trouble with drivers or something. And I don't think this is a big deal because, per the reviews, Windows 7 booted on this machine in about 45 seconds, so if anything, this is going faster than it's supposed to. Although it almost seems like it's on the slow side once you realize that this machine actually has an SSD. It's one of the earliest systems I'm aware of that came with an SSD as standard hardware. In fact, you could get two if you wanted, though they are kind of weird. They look like this. Uh, they're just kind of bare boards. There's no plastic or metal housing or anything. And they use an interface I haven't seen before. Apparently uh, people call it micro SATA. It's got this weird little notch here, uh, but you can get adapters that convert this into normal SATA. So I don't even know what it's really for. At any rate, the perf figures on this are not great. Passmark has this reading and writing at 164 and 124 megabytes per second sequential, which is okay, but the 4K random seek test only hits seven megabytes per second, and my tests were actually even worse than that. For comparison, a contemporary Intel SSD delivered twice the performance in all categories at least, and even a spinning disk from a year later did better in sequential read. Still, however, it's an SSD, and those all have one very important feature in common. They have zero seek time. So that means that even if Vista's many tiny files may have impacted the boot speed on a spinning disk, this one wouldn't be affected. Mind you, it's not like we've actually seen that problem in reality. The whole premise of this series has kind of fallen apart. Uh, I've tested on crappy 5400 RPM or even 4200 RPM hard drives, but Vista always seems to launch in like 30 to 50 seconds on all the machines in the series. The quick boot OSs are rarely much faster than that, if they are at all, so it seems like maybe this problem was imaginary. But I'm also not running this thing with all the original vendor crapware on it. Maybe when Dell was done loading it up with McAfee and 
instant web offers or whatever. Maybe it booted a lot slower. Or maybe after you'd used it for a few months, they figured you know, you'd gum it up with viruses and whatnot. But I can't test those things. At any rate, my initial premise that SSDs would have resolved the slow boot issue all on their own seems like it might be specious. It seems like there really wasn't an issue for them to resolve. I never said anything in this series was correct. This is just entertainment. Don't put too much stock in it. So anyway, now that we're booted, I can make a, a few more points. This display, despite shipping in a supposedly executive grade machine with a 17 inch footprint, is still only 1600 by 900. I will never not be disappointed by this, but at least it is in 1366 by 768. Uh, you can also see, maybe under this lighting, that the keyboard is backlit, which is pretty much its only redeeming quality because in every other way, it's just rancid. This is another part that doesn't really match the uh, size of the chassis. It looks like they got it from a 14 inch notebook. It's just lost in this expanse of empty palm rest. And it's not a good keyboard either. I hate the layout. Uh, the keys feel like they're sunken below the surface. They're very mushy. Uh, they have bad travel distance. I generally hate typing on it. Uh, and you know, I've raised this subject before and I understand people's arguments against it, but honestly, if you're gonna ship a keyboard this crappy, at least, Throw in a numpad to fill up some of the wasted space, please. The touchpad also kind of sucks in its own right. Typical for the era, it's pretty small and it's nearly impossible to type on this thing without your palms hitting it. And it doesn't have multi-touch or at least there's no indication that it does. Synaptics was actually shipping multi-touch trackpads on a lot of machines all the way back in the mid 2000s. Just most people never realized they were there because the drivers had all those features disabled by default. And to be unfair, you also weren't missing much because the multi-touch sucked compared to what Apple had. Even if it is there, Dell's drivers don't enable it. So all we get is the typical scroll area along the right side of the pad. There's no other special features. But if you find that too fiddly, you can also just scroll up here. That is the completely unique feature that I said this machine had. It's called Dell Edge Touch, and it's a capacitive strip under the right screen bezel. I'm guessing that's why the bezel is so wide. You can use it just like the scroll area on the touchpad. It seems to work in all the software I've tried it in. So yeah, there it is, and I think it's unique. I don't think any other laptop had this feature. Now, you could say this is sort of like having a touchscreen on a laptop, but touchscreens on laptops are usually pretty awkward because you gotta sort of hold your hand in midair the whole time you're using them. With a smartphone or a tablet, that's not so much of a problem. You're not fighting gravity because rather than holding your hand in midair and tapping something that, that doesn't resist, you know, that just sort of wobbles, uh, you're holding something in your hand and you're pinching it between your fingers and your thumb. Well, with a laptop touchscreen, you're fighting gravity the whole time you're using it. Well, this edge touch thing sort of makes up for that a bit because you put your finger here on the edge and you pinch with finger and thumb. I'd say this is a pretty cool feature all on its own, but it does more than just scroll. By tapping this nearly invisible little box below the strip, you open the edge touch menu. Now, as I've said many times before, the only features that PC vendors can really figure out how to add are program launchers and media controls, so, this offers program launchers and media controls. Who knew? But it does actually have some value props. The default launchers are Internet Explorer and your email client, because of course they are. Those are the only launcher buttons you ever find on anything. But you can customize those to launch other things. What's more interesting, however, is this button here. That opens the media controls. Uh, so we've got your usual, you know, go back, play pause, go forward, stop. But then we've got the volume slider. Now Dell really could have missed the landing here. They could have screwed this up, but they got it right. The volume slider works in absolute mode, not relative. So you just press the spot for the level you want and it goes straight there. Now call me petty, but it's always made me so mad that nobody provides absolute volume controls on PCs. If you're at the library and you open a video and it's a lot louder than you intended, you can't just turn the volume down real quick. You gotta press a button over and over and over and watch the slider inch down a few pixels at a time. You have to just stab the mute button, then turn the volume down, then unmute, then slowly turn it back. It sucks, it's dumb. Dell finally solved this problem. And if that was the only thing Edge Touch delivered, it'd still be something I wish every machine had, but there's more. Let's open the config utility and then we'll load up a custom menu I made. This one, gets you straight to the volume control, so it saves you a tap. Uh, but now it has a brightness control as well. So we can just 
press here, select a brightness level directly without having to tap, 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 tap. Finally, we have this button at the bottom. This is the magnifier mode. Now, as far as I can tell, this only works in web browsers and probably realistically just in an Explorer 7 or whatever this is. But what this does is it lets you zoom into and out of a page again without having to press a button over and over and over. Now, it's actually not an absolute control. You can keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you can't pick a zoom level directly, but this is still a lot nicer than hitting a button over and over and over and over and over. I have some complaints about Edge Touch. Uh, for instance, it doesn't support custom submenus. That's kind of a bummer. Also, when you're scrolling, uh, if you go off the bottom of the strip, it just opens the menu. That's irritating, but otherwise, this is a pretty cool feature, albeit probably not worth the inch wide bezel. All right, let's get on to unique feature number two. I'm gonna have to set up some gadgets here, just a moment. All right, I got all my stuff set up here and I'm just gonna plug this weird little gadget in. And there we go, we've got a picture and I've got a mouse and keyboard hooked up through this uh, thing here and uh, no wires connecting them to the laptop itself. This is a wireless dock. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a dock that doesn't require wires. And it uses technology that was actually supposed to become a standard called wireless USB, and that's also just what it sounds like. It's USB that operates wirelessly. Uh, there's a transceiver built into this laptop, this little sync button on the right side for connecting to the dock. You can see it's got the antenna right there. Uh, and as long as this thing is powered on, it acts as though you've just got uh, seven USB ports hanging out in space. Uh, four of them are exposed on the device itself. You've got two there, and then you've got uh, two more here on the back. And then the other ones are connected to an internal USB audio adapter that feeds the headphone and mic ports on the front. And then you have a display link uh, DVI port on the back here, which can also be adapted out to VGA. So it's pretty much just like one of those uh, little uh, pluggable brand USB 3 docks, uh, except that it's wireless and it actually works pretty well. The one problem it has is pretty bad latency. Uh, if you watch the window and my hand here, yeah, there's like a half second of delay, but I think that was pretty much normal for USB display link devices anyway and the range on it is pretty dang good. Let's see that. All right, should start cutting out right about there. And uh, after here, it's pretty much useless. So basically about that far. Now, obviously you probably wouldn't have tried to push the range out that far since really wouldn't be much point unless you hope to put your laptop in one room and carry a monitor around the house. You'd generally not be using this any further out than a couple feet because as the term dock implies, you'd really just use this to quickly connect your peripherals when you bring the machine home from the office. And you can do that with a normal mechanical dock like laptops used to have before the scourge of USB-C docks. Do not engage me on that subject. But the trouble is conventional docks take up a bunch of desk space and they're not very elegant. They're not very executive. As a CEO, your primary concerns aren't practicality or material value to your company or to society. It's simply the appearance of hyper-competence and extreme wealth. Those things are what really matters. And what better way to appear ahead of the curve in 2010 than to have a PC without any wires whatsoever. So this does what it's supposed to do, uh, I suppose. But let's move on to the final unique feature, which I'm going to introduce in a roundabout way by insulting the machine some more. To put too fine a point on it, executive grade means that something looks impressive. It doesn't mean it actually works well. The Z600's anemic CPU and RAM are pretty bad, for instance, but you have to actually turn the machine on to see those. You can tell this is a piece of crap without even getting that far. Just pick it up. With the screen closed, it's, it's okay, I guess. But if you open it up and then you pick it up, Oh man, you probably can't see this on the camera, but all the weight is in the back. The bottom weighs almost nothing. It's not nearly as stiff as it ought to be. So it's actually bending right now. It's flexing. It feels hollow and rattly and it twists in your hands. It just feels cheap. And even when it's sitting on a desk, if you're just typing on it, you can tell it's, it's crap. It's hollow. 
So that's why when you get around to taking the bottom cover off, you won't be surprised to find that it looks like a big, ugly mess. I've been inside of literally thousands of laptops in my life, hundreds of different models. I can tell when something is built for businesses versus consumers. And this thing looks like consumer sludge. It looks like a Walmart special. I can't put my finger on exactly why. It's something about the layers of unkempt ribbon cables flying around maybe, but in any case, to the trained eye, it looks cheap and certainly not cheerful. We can make out some of the basic parts here. Uh, this is probably the RAM. Uh, here's the SSD, the Wi-Fi module, all the usual stuff, but what's this in the middle? It's a copper coil. And if we pop off the board it's attached to and flip it over, wow, that's a lot of power electronics, including what I think is a bank of surface mount capacitors. This looks curiously like a wireless charger. And as the label clearly says, that's exactly what it is. The Z600 had a number of accessories, including this thing is pretty miserable, to be honest. Laptop stands are pretty common things, but typically they aren't, you know, solid aluminum plates, no hole in the back or anything. This not only takes up a 17 inch rectangle of desk space, you can't even route any cables underneath it. It's just this big, miserable, sharp edged thing to smack your wrists on, but you're an executive with a wireless laptop, so you needed a place to charge it. At this time, I don't think that anything like the modern wireless charging systems we have now existed, but the concepts go back over a century. And the biggest enduring problem with the technology is that it doesn't work if the two coils don't line up perfectly. Nowadays, you could sort of get away with aligning your phone on a charging stand by hand, sort of centering it like this. But with a laptop, I mean, forget about it. Making this work at all demanded that the machine be precisely located. So Dell made this stand that's got a lip on the front uh, and it's got uh, some dips that meet up with rubber feet on the bottom and also I've just realized this uh, half the purpose of the shoulder pads is actually to align the thing if we look here these two rubber pegs actually slot in here and make sure it lands in the right spot that's what the dang things are for if we remove the top cover from the stand you can see the supply coil here and if we lift up this board, we can see a whole raft of capacitors and more power components. There's also a cooling fan, so presumably it gets pretty toasty. I don't think the coil on the PC side is ventilated nearly as well, but maybe the recipient of wireless charging doesn't get as hot as the source. I wouldn't know though, because this doesn't work. I should say uh, at this point that I have no idea if the Z600 ever actually sold any units at retail. There's very few on eBay, mostly just spare parts. And I can't find much info online other than a handful of reviews. And this makes sense because honestly, I'm not sure who would have bought one. The minimum price of a Z600 was $1,700 for this setup here. Two gigs of RAM, a 1.4 gigahertz processor, and a 64 gig SSD. That's a terrible deal, but the higher trim models with four gigs of RAM and a 1.6 gigahertz chip exceeded three grand. And if you bought one with dual SSDs and all the accessories, you were spending $5,000, which is obscene for this class of hardware. If this was a super high res IPS display, if it had an ultra high performance CPU or a GPU, or if it were made entirely of titanium, I'd get it. But paying $3,400 for plastic clamshell around a sub two gigahertz processor in 2010, you'd have to be out of your mind. I suspect that mine and probably every other one on the used market was actually a review sample. Almost none of the reviews mentioned the wireless charging feature at all. So even if it was only in the high trim model, that's what the reviewers should have received. So if they didn't have it, and this was one that was sent to a reviewer, then maybe Dell never actually shipped it. Sure enough, when I received the machine, it didn't have the coil installed. It also didn't come with the stand or the wireless dock or the wireless USB module for the dock. I had to get all those parts separately on eBay. They all came new in box as if they'd been sitting in Dell service warehouses, maybe waiting for customers that never materialized. The wireless USB module worked as soon as I put it in, but the charging coil, not so much. I put the machine on the stand, I plug the stand in, nothing happens, no charging. The fan in the stand doesn't even spin up. While investigating this, I got to wondering how the stand knows to start delivering power. I'm sure nowadays there's some kind of short range RF communication, maybe through the coils themselves, but here I think they're using a much simpler approach. 
On the charger pad, next to the coil, there's a little black block that looks for all the world like an IR receiver. And on the laptop, there's a little block that looks for all the world like an IR LED. And this makes sense, right? The laptop just screams, hey, I'm here, hey, I'm here, all the time as long as it's on. And if the pad sees that, then it knows the laptop's on the stand and it turns on the juice, right? But hang on a second. The top of the pad and the bottom of the laptop are opaque plastic. So how does that signal get there? The first one is easy. The pad isn't actually opaque. If we pick it up and hold it in front of a light, it turns out there's a little red window here that's transparent to infrared. But what about the laptop? The bottom is solid ABS. There's no light getting through that. Well, when I first got this machine, I opened the little panel on the bottom because like anyone who's worked on a laptop before, I assumed that would be a memory upgrade slot. But like I said, the RAM on here is soldered. So when I opened it up, I just found blank plastic. That is, until I installed the charging module, which peeks out through this opening. Presumably, this cover is interchangeable. Models equipped with wireless charging would get a panel with an IR window in it. But even if I remove the panel, so there's a clear line of sight to the pad, it still won't charge. And my phone camera, which could definitely see IR, still doesn't see anything coming out of this LED. So either the module is broken or it isn't actually enabled. There's actually a BIOS setting that you have to turn on to enable wireless charging, but I did that and it still doesn't work, so all I can think of is that the feature required some kind of firmware level flag that had to be set by Dell at the factory. There's so little info about these online that I'd almost think the feature was never actually implemented, but I did find one review that confirms that it did work. But I'm not missing much because naturally it performed really poorly. They say it took six hours and 18 minutes to fully charge, and when they picked up the laptop afterwards, the top of the stand was 125 degrees Fahrenheit. They speculate on what this might do to the machine over time, and yeah, one wonders. This is honestly just not worth it. Plugging in a cable is not a big lift. All this isn't called for, but it is a pretty big flex, which was the point of all this crap. As far as I know, edge touch is completely unique. That's a flex. And as far as I know, this was the only wireless laptop charger shipped until maybe two years ago. Huge flex. And while other wireless docks did get sold by Dell and other vendors circa 2013 to 2016, as far as I can tell, it seems like a fad that came and went and, and maybe came back recently, but certainly nobody was doing it in 2010. All this stuff does not make the machine worth four or five grand. Nothing could do that given its base specs, its ho-hum user experience, its terrible build quality. But if Dell were trying to prove that they could in theory innovate, they had nothing to worry about and yet they continued to flex. Since it's part of this series, this machine obviously has a second operating system besides Windows Vista, but it doesn't quite dual boot. Also, like most quick start machines, we have two power buttons, one here and one here. I started up with this one, so let's power it down. And now let's start back up with the second one. And here we are in latitude on, and that took uh, <laughs> considerably longer than booting Windows. Wow. When I timed this during research, I got like 50 seconds, but I think that was like a minute and a half. I don't even know what's going on. Well, anyway, as usual, the question is, what exactly have we booted into here? Well, if you paused on the right frame, you might have noticed a little badge that says Monta Vista Linux. That's not a tremendously well-known distro since it was never intended for normal users. It's a commercial product uh, which ostensibly has been heavily modified from normal Linux to be more appropriate for real-time applications and embedded devices. Basically, you might find this in a DVD player or a cargo crane control panel, but probably not on someone's PC. And as you'd expect for an embedded operating system, it's not super capable. Much like the later versions of Phoenix Hyperspace after HP ruined it, this has a fixed user interface. Everything can do is here on one screen. So we start up directly into an email client, for instance. Uh, if we go look at the about, you'll see this is just evolution, which is a, a common open source email package. 
And the other two tabs at the top here are also part of evolution. Uh, this is the calendar section, and this is the address book. Uh, and then the fourth one, of course, is a web browser. As usual, this is a basically unmodified build of Firefox 3.0 from 2008 that can't ever be updated, so it'll be useless for eternity. But let's take a closer look at this about screen here. Okay, copyright 2008, Mozilla 5.0, X11, so it's definitely on Linux, and it says Linux right there, but then what's, what's this bit here? That's the architecture that this is compiled for, and it says ARM v7L. Now hang on just a moment. Core 2 duos don't run ARM, and you know, emulating it was out of the question in 2010, especially on a 1.4 gigahertz chip. It wouldn't even make any sense. I mean, this is just basic Linux with basic FOSS software. This is all available for x86. Why would this not be compiled for this platform? You might also notice as you explore Latitude On that it's not very fast. It's, it's not tremendously, it's slow. It's dog slow. Everything is just miserably slow. And let me go open up an email here. It's got a photo attachment. And there it is. Now, this is a fairly large image, but still, no computer from this era should have taken that long to load this, right? You might also notice, uh, if you had a USB keyboard or mouse plugged in when you were in Windows, that those don't work anymore in Latitude On. And if you had an Ethernet cable plugged in, that doesn't work either. And if you had a monitor plugged in, that's also stopped working. Now, Linux drivers used to be weird, I'll give you that, but why would any of those things not work? They're just basic onboard peripherals. I know for a fact they're all Intel chips that had rock solid Linux support. And why would Dell bundle an OS with their machine that didn't have the right drivers? It doesn't make sense that most of this laptop's basic components wouldn't function. Well, they probably would if any of them were powered up right now. Take a look at the power button. It's dark. The machine's not running right now. The CPU isn't powered on. We are not using this computer. We are using this. This is a Latitude On module. It's actually a whole second computer that lives inside your computer. Yo dog, etc. It consists primarily of a Texas Instruments OMAP 3430, uh, an ARM SOC that got a ton of play in the handheld device market back then. Uh, there's also a chip that combines 256 megs of flash with 128 megs of RAM, uh, and there's a second one on the back. So it's got a half gig of storage and a quarter gig of RAM. This whole thing plugs into the laptop through a huge multi-pin connector on its back, and basically it brain slugs the motherboard. When you press that second power button, instead of turning on the Intel CPU, the chipset, the hard drive controller, the fans, and everything else, it powers up just this little module. And it's wired into the keyboard, the mouse, and the LCD display controller so it can drive those directly without powering up the rest of the system. So the remaining hardware all stays inert. I would guess the wired Ethernet and USB ports can't be used because they're built into the Intel chipset, which isn't turned on right now. And the Wi-Fi can't be borrowed uh, because the OMAP lacks PCIe of its own. So instead, it has its own onboard Wi-Fi controller and dedicated antenna ports. It also has its own onboard USB interface, but you can't access that. It's wired up to the laptop's internal keyboard and mouse, uh, plus an interface for firmware updates. And that's a very interesting subject. When I got this machine, it had a password on Latitude on. Uh, it forces you to set a password as soon as you launch it for the first time, and if you forget it, there's no way to get back in except to just wipe and reload the flash. So I had to go download the firmware updater, and when I ran it, I noticed that it had a Linux syslog in the bottom of the window updating in real time as it installed, and the logs ended up being pretty interesting. Uh, for one thing, I found plenty of references to the word blacktop, which appears to be the code name for this product. In fact, if you dig around Dell's website, you can actually find a few downloads that call it by that name. I also found articles using that name, uh, including one that states that Montavista developed this for Dell under the name Montabello. Uh, that actually had its own page on their website, which suggested they hope to sell it to multiple vendors. Montavista's marketing said that it could boot from cold to a running app in five seconds and that apps could launch in a few milliseconds. So I'm not sure what changed in between Montavista's promises and Dell's reality, but I'm not having an anomalous experience here. The reviewers of the time said the same thing, that Latitude On starts up and runs much more slowly than Windows and that this kind of makes it pointless. 
And now my guess is that Monte Vista was referring to the core OS itself, just the kernel and the graphical environment, not anything running on top of it. They probably imagined that the uh, applications would be bespoke and highly optimized. And then Dell simply cross compiled the current versions of two desktop Linux apps and called it good, completely wasting all of their effort. One wonders if Monte Vista felt like they got burned on this deal. Dell's implementation of their product probably didn't portray it in a good light to other potential customers. But at any rate, it's convenient that I got all these leads from the flash utility instead of just a meaningless progress bar, but it left me very curious as to how exactly it does that flashing. When you start the process, it has to wait while it boots the module. And then the syslog that it's displaying, that's coming from the Linux kernel running on the OMAP. So it's not just reaching in and touching the flash chip directly. It has to actually be talking to the ARM processor as a peer. Well, sure enough, I discovered that when the flash process starts, a virtual network interface shows up in Windows with a very curious line speed of 500 megabits per second. And if you sniff that interface, you find that the software is just connecting to the module over TCP. Uh, there's one port for syslog that it uses to monitor the update and another for control. I couldn't figure out that protocol, but it's obviously just going to be pushing data and commands with some bespoke syntax. But per the logs, uh, the Ethernet interface is a USB device. So it looks like they took the very simple approach of just butting a pair of USB NICs together at the board level, one going into the OMAP and one going into the PC. It's a brilliant solution. The firmware install process is also surprisingly verbose. It tells you which packages it's installing by their actual names. Unsurprisingly, this is all standard FOSS stuff. And on that note, you might be wondering if it's possible to jailbreak this thing, since having access to a dedicated ARM system is more interesting than just a weird Linux hidden in a disk partition like most of the machines in this series. Well, in short, I'm sure it is, it's just beyond me. The install packages are all signed, so presumably you'd need a signing key to replace them with modified versions or the installer would reject them. And honestly, in the end, it'd be kind of pointless because you'd just end up with a crappy Android phone stuck inside a crappier laptop. That is essentially what's going on here. When you power up Latitude On, you're really just connecting your laptop's keyboard, mouse, and monitor to a 2010 era smartphone. And the thing about smartphones in this era is that even the good ones sucked. The OMAP 3430 powered the original Motorola Droid, the Nokia N900, and the Palm Pre. I never used the N900, but I had the other two, and they were both dog slow. That was with mobile optimized OSs and software. I'm sure Monta Vista was a better bet on this hardware than say Ubuntu 10, but this is still an extremely slow processor. According to some reviews, the OMAP chip runs at only 600 megahertz in 2010. Now maybe with properly optimized software, this wouldn't be as bad as it sounds, but even if that's true, there isn't any optimized software to be found here. Now I've taken some liberties in this series. Some of the machines I've covered never even made the claim that they started up instantly, but Dell did. Their marketing material said outright that Latitude On would have no boot time, and that's just not true. The reviews made no bones about this. They say that it starts up slower than Windows and that this makes it pointless. In fact, one reviewer even points out that it only starts up quickly if you put Latitude On in standby instead of powering it off. And they point out that you can say the same thing about Windows. Sleep and Hibernate were reliable features at this point in time, and they took about 10 seconds on average to resume. So this just doesn't deliver on Dell's promise, period. But curiously, it actually comes a lot closer to satisfying a different claim they made, one that other quick start solutions had promised but failed to achieve. That was extended battery life. The original battery life on this machine was actually pretty unfortunate. Despite the Cracker Jack CPU, it only got about three hours on a full charge, and the purpose of Latitude On was primarily to extend that battery life. And as far as I can tell, it pulled it off. If we put the machine on a watt meter with the battery removed, we can see the power consumption in Windows at idle is about 20 to 22 watts. If we open a browser and scroll around, it goes as high as 30. Now this battery is only rated at 80 watt hours, so at best you're looking at, yeah, about three and a half hours. But if we switch over to Latitude On, we see the idle consumption is only about 10 to 11 watts, and it doesn't really increase with activity. That's almost a third the power, which theoretically turns this into an eight hour battery. I don't have the patience to test this fully, but the math scans. The OMAP is designed to run on much smaller batteries for much longer than a typical laptop, so these are the numbers we'd expect. This is quite an accomplishment. But is it really? As I've said before in this series, 
What's the point of doubling your battery life if everything takes twice as long? And who wants to get eight hours out of a machine that can't do anything but read email and view web pages? You can't open a PDF or a .doc email attachment. You can't install browser plugins. You can't save files, even to a flash drive. This thing is more limited than the contemporary smartphones that shared its DNA. So impressive or not, is this actually worth it? Well, if you specifically wanted a 16 to 17 inch machine with long battery life, I guess maybe it was. In the market at this time, as far as I can tell, three to five hours was the best you'd ever get on a machine this size. And to get even to five hours, you'd have needed a battery twice this size. Would have ruined this thing's executive sleekness. So very possibly, this was the only eight hour laptop in this size class that you could buy. That said, if you didn't need it to be that big, you did have other options. Apple would sell you a MacBook Pro 13 inch that could do eight hours for $1,200. Lenovo would sell you a 12 inch X201 that could do 11 hours for $1,500. And Dell themselves could sell you a 12 inch E4200 that could get 11 hours for $2,700. And even if these machines weren't as big, they did have much better specs. So things didn't take nearly as long to happen. I realize that these aren't necessarily the metrics that executives care about. Your average CEO probably does, in fact, spend 99% of his day staring at an email client, so this probably made some sense. But it still seems completely absurd to me. We have proof that you could buy at least a 13-inch computer, but with a 2.4 gigahertz core 2 and 4 gigs of RAM for half the price of this thing, and then run that for six or eight hours. Why not just make that bigger? It really seems like Dell, instead of putting in the gargantuan effort to literally sell you two computers in one trench coat, could have just put the parts from an E4200 into a bigger package and been done with it. Could the monitor itself truly be the difference? Does the backlight for a 17 inch display consume an extra 10 watts all on its own? Well, it can't, otherwise it would be right now. So I don't know how to rule on this. Maybe Latitude On is incredibly cool. Maybe it's incredibly stupid. It's certainly clever. I just don't know if it was a good idea. I do know it didn't last very long, but even so, it's very possible that this isn't the first time you've heard of it. The Z600 may have sold in very small quantities, but this machine and this one sold a lot more. These are the Dell Latitudes, Dell's Latitude. E4300 and E6410. Uh, the first one here is the 13 inch version of the E4200 that I just mentioned, which is mostly why I have it here. I don't actually have all the parts, including the, the bottom cover, so it's not a very good demo machine. But since everything is just hanging out here, I can show you that this motherboard also sports the uh, funky Latitude On logo you might have noticed on the button on the previous machine. Now, you can only see that because I don't have the module for this. They weren't standard equipment. In fact, very few machines that I've ever found in the wild had them, but they all supported them. So if we open the screen here, you got your normal power button, and then look at that. You got your latitude on button. Likewise, if we open up the E6410, you've got your normal power button, and then your latitude on button. These machines can both do the same trick as the Z600, but my particular specimens actually do it in completely different ways. Now the E4300 won't be terribly useful for this demo, so I'm gonna put that away, but I do have another E6410 that will be. Conveniently, they came color-coded for easy sorting. Uh, I even have a blue one. Windows starts on this about as fast as the other one, so we'll just go straight to Latitude On. All right, that took about 20, 25 seconds. Now we have to log in. And there we are. But things look pretty different. We first have to choose an app to launch before we can continue, and there's a lot more here than there was on the Z600. Uh, we have an email client, we have a browser, uh, we have a chat client, a VoIP client, and then remote desktop. Uh, so let's uh, just pick the browser here, and that'll put us to another 20 second wait. Uh, you know, to be fair, that was more like uh, 12 or 13 seconds, wasn't it? 
So now we're finally in latitude on proper, and it's even more different than what we saw before. For one thing, it has windows instead of the apps just being full screen. It's like a real operating system. But things get weird real fast. Let's check out this email app, for instance. Well, instead of a client, it just asks you which one of these named email services you use. And if you pick one, it just opens a web browser and goes to the site. Haven't we seen this somewhere before? Of course we have, in Splashtop, also known as Asus ExpressGate, back in episode two. Uh, in fact, if we click on the arrow on the app launcher down here, there's even more apps over here, and would you look at that? It's the awful flash-based photo viewer from Splashtop. And if we look at the About page in the web browser, Device VM Inc, makers of Splashtop. It's just Splashtop, again! Splashtop was the most common quick start OS by far. Every vendor that dabbled in the stuff used it. Lenovo, Asus, HP, Dell, LG, and two or three other companies. Even if they also had their own products, they also shipped Splashtop at some point or another. And that has its pluses and minuses. A plus, like I said, we actually get draggable windows instead of a full screen only interface. A minus, no native email client, which really sucks and seems inexplicable. Another plus, more apps. A minus, they're mostly the ones we've seen before in Splashtop, which are pretty crummy or at least not too exciting. The chat app is Pigeon. The VoIP app is Skype. These are okay, I guess, but it also has the same awful flash-based media player and photo album apps that we saw back in Expressgate. They're not unusable, but they're pretty slow and they feel very sludgy. Another plus, however, is that it does include a remote desktop app, as well as something called VMware View and something called Citrix Receiver. I've never used either of these, but I assume they're thin clients, uh, which would massively increase how useful this thing can be. I can't get the remote desktop app to connect to anything, but that's probably because it only sports Windows XP or older. So those are nice additions, but otherwise this is pretty much just Splashtop. So it has nothing in common with the Latitude On that we just saw on the Z600. And that includes the sluggishness. Uh, this is actually pretty responsive because it's running on the CPU. Let me explain. Latitude On modules came in several flavors, and I kind of lied to you earlier about this. The one that I showed you isn't what's inside my Z600. Dell integrated the module into the motherboard on that model. I believe this is the OMAP chip right here, and that's the combo RAM slash flash chip right next to it. The module I put on screen would have actually gone in an E4200 or 4300 in a little dedicated slot. I just used that JPEG because it was a little more concise. Now, presumably there was a similar module for the E6410, but I haven't found any evidence of that. I'm not sure they actually made an ARM module for these machines. The only ones I've seen are what Dell called Latitude on Flash, and that's what's in here. This module goes into a slot in the back of the machine instead of that huge multi-pin socket, and it's much smaller and much simpler. There's no CPU, just a NAND flash chip and a USB interface. So in other words, it's basically just a special flash drive that the machine is hardwired to boot from when you press the second power button. And so the value add of Latitude on Flash is really just what the other Splash Top machines offered, which is pretty minimal if you ask me. For one thing, it is a separate OS from Windows. It's really hard to offer dual boot setups to average consumers and Splash Top makes that easy. So to be fair, if your Windows install dies or it's just all crapped up and takes eons to boot, you could still jump into this thing. I guess that is a feature. But Dell was probably more focused on the theoretical speed advantages. The 6410 not being a luxury executive machine would have shipped with a spinning hard drive, which were ostensibly very slow to boot contemporary Windows. It would have bumped up the cost of the machine a lot to add an SSD large enough to fit a full fat OS like Windows Vista, but Splashtop is so small it can fit inside a few megs. It's probably the same reasoning that Asus used with their ExpressGate enabled motherboards that stored Splashtop inside a similar SSD soldered to the board. So this makes things real weird, right? Like if someone says that they have Latitude on, it doesn't always mean the same thing. In fact, this machine was loaned to me by one uh, Raymond, thank you Ray, and for all I know, he's only gonna find out that he didn't have the ARM version when he watches this video. Hope that ain't a bummer. So what's this all about? Well, I think that maybe Dell just didn't wanna ship machines with you know a whole second power button that only worked if you bought an expensive add-on module. They wanted to offer some cost-reduced way of delivering some kind of feature instead of just having a dead key up here. And 
it makes sense that they chose not to reuse MontaVista for it. For one thing, it was probably compiled and optimized solely for ARM. I'm not sure it would have made sense to deliver an x86 version, but also Dell didn't have to use it and they probably preferred not to. I'm sure MontaVista was pretty limited in its capabilities. Splashtop, on the other hand, was already available on x86 and it came with a bunch of apps that ran fine on contemporary laptop processors. So why not go for it? The drawback, of course, is that there's no benefit to battery life. This pulls 25 to 30 watts under use, just like Windows, and there's no boot time benefit. Windows 7 boots on this machine in under 40 seconds off a spinning disk, while Latitude On takes a total of 45. It's actually slower. The ARM version of Latitude On may have been sluggish, but at least it justified itself with incredible battery life, and for better or for worse, it was a more or less unique software bundle. This is the same thing a half dozen other vendors were offering at the exact same time. It's just Splashtop Linux. And much like I asserted in my review of Splashtop, I can't think of a reason anyone would have ever booted into this. Sure, I might have asserted that Dell just wanted the second power button to do something instead of nothing, but then why even bother with the special flash module? Was that even necessary? Well, let's go down that road. If we pop the bottom on the red 6410, you can see that it has no latitude on module at all. So now let's pop the top and turn it on with the second power button. All right, that took less than 20 seconds. Let's just log in here. And now we're at yet another new interface. This is called Latitude On Reader. Uh, yes, Dell made three different versions of Latitude On, all completely different. Reader just installs to your hard drive. I'm not sure exactly where. I'm sure there's a splash top folder hidden somewhere in your Windows partition. That's how it works on the Lenovo and the Asus machines I've looked at. But this version has been severely cut down compared to those. It has no network stack, no browser, no media support. So it loads about twice as fast. Once it's done loading though, you don't get much. This is the Reader software. This is a bespoke app that does nothing except show you your email. Well, you can also see your calendar and your contacts and your tasks, but the point is it just shows you all these things. Unlike the full fat Latitude On, whose email client could send and receive messages, or Latitude On Flash, which would at least let you go to a website and send and receive messages, this doesn't let you send or even receive. Here's how this works. You have to install Microsoft Outlook under Windows, and then when you install Reader, it adds a plugin that periodically makes a copy of your mail, calendar, contacts, and tasks, and saves it all to a file hidden on the hard drive somewhere. When you load up Reader, the app, which is some custom thing that Dell threw together, just loads that file and displays the contents. That's it. It can't connect to the internet. It can't receive or send mail. It's not actually a mail client. It's just a Reader. So, What's this all about? Who's this for? I'm kind of baffled myself. And the thing I find most curious is that I think this is what MontaVista imagined Dell would do with their Montevello product. This is exactly the kind of micro application that could have launched in milliseconds on their super slim down kernel. It's got no network dependencies, anything like that. All it needs is file system and UI libraries. So this app could have been 10 or 20 kilobytes if they designed it right. And if Dell had shipped that, instead of the entire evolution email suite and a full fat web browser, then I bet Latitude on ARM would have booted in just a second or two from a cold start. And that would mean you could open your laptop and fire it up instantly to check your calendar or read emails you'd received before leaving the office. And the experience would be more like a modern smartphone. You just open it, it would be on, it would drain almost no battery, and then you'd put it away again. That would have been kind of cool. But this isn't cool at all. <laughs> Running this tiny application on an ARM CPU might have made sense. Running it from a tiny flash drive might have made sense, but this is running on the Intel CPU at full power and running from a spinning hard drive, which puts the total power usage at 30 to 35 watts. It's worse than Windows. So at this point, why not just include the full splash top so the user could have a web browser? It makes no sense. The only remaining advantage I can see is the fast boot and Okay, I can't deny that 20 seconds is technically quicker than 35 or 40. And again, that gap might have widened as the machine got cluttered up with the usual crapware or fragmentation. But again, you can solve all of that by just putting Windows in standby. 
I really don't know what the hell Dell thought anyone would want this for. So there you have it. The beast that Dell built in all its unglory. And what's really strange about all this is how unexciting it is. Think back to the Phoenix Hyperspace episode if you watched that one. Some of you claimed in the comments that you weren't impressed. I know you didn't know it was possible to do stuff that cursed on the PC platform. But hey, I know, you gotta flex, your secret's safe with me, whatever makes you feel smart. But with this, I mean, <laughs> show of hands, who couldn't have guessed that this was possible? I mean, with this thing, it's basically just a KVM switch. Is anyone shocked that you can swap an LVDS monitor panel and a couple USB peripherals between two machines in the same case? No, anyone could have guessed that was doable. The only thing that's really surprising is that they did it. I'm surprised Dell actually brought this to market. These two are nothing, you know, it's just splash top and pretty much just splash top. This thing on the other hand, man, this is a lot. It's simple in concept. Sure, you can say, you know, oh, it's just a KVM, but they still had to draw the rest of the owl. They had to design and build essentially a little smartphone buddy that lives inside your PC. They had to partner with an embedded Linux vendor. They had to make three different versions. So they'd have something to offer to people who didn't want to go the whole nine yards. So all those hardware power buttons wouldn't be useless dead weight on the low trim models. As with so many of the quick start specimens, and really many of the things on my channel in general, I am truly amazed at how much work, how much cleverness they put into a really dumb, impractical idea that was never going to hold water. And what's more, this technique will actually be seen again in this series. This is probably the, the coolest example, but it's not the only example of a machine that's really two different machines with significantly different architectures. So keep an eye out for those future episodes, but this one's ready to wrap up. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to my channel so I know you're into this sort of thing. Maybe turn on notifications too, so there's some chance that YouTube will notify you when I upload. It hasn't happened yet, but hope springs eternal. If you really like this, however, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing. I'm going through some rough financial times in life right now. Uh, for instance, my sewer exploded and it's costing me an absolute fortune to replace it. This is my sole source of income, this YouTube channel. So if you don't wanna see me buried in debt and instead wanna see me make more videos like this one, then maybe sign up to throw me a few bucks a month. Pays for my groceries, gas in my car, new sewer lines, and silly laptops with weird features that time mercifully forgot. I'm incredibly grateful to all the people who are supporting me already. Thank you all so much and to everyone else. Thanks for watching. Really, it's amazing all these people supporting me. I had to get rid of a bookcase just to make room.